Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, college football fans across the nation and around the world. This is Tim May with the Tim May podcast, and this is a this is the big game week uh, podcast, right? Awesome, Ward. Yeah, just as we all thought, uh, middle of November. Circle it on your calendar. Ohio State, Indiana, for all the Big Ten East Division marbles. Just yeah, I wish. Yeah, I wish uh, five six weeks ago on one of my podcasts, I wished. We hadn't cut out the part where I said I thought that Ohio State was going to be playing Indiana for all of marbles in the Big Ten East. I wish I hadn't cut that part out, don't you? Yeah, that's you know that's the director's cut. Sometimes you think, well, you know, does this need to be in there this week? Are we stretching out the show too long? Is that too yeah. crazy? Are the people ready for that in 2020 to throw at them that Indiana uh, might be the second best team in the Big Ten East? Let's just wait. If it comes, you know, then we'll tell them. Uh, but you know. It's better to ease your way into it, I guess. Yeah, I was going to say, too bad we burned that tape. But that's another story. And it's not even tape anymore. We were just burning. But I digress. You know, I've got a couple of special guests on this week. Uh, awesome to uh, – man, I get your nicknames mixed up now. Sorry about that. <laughs> awesome. I got a, a couple of uh, guests on, special guests on, just to talk about moments in the Ohio State-Indiana series, which were kind of interesting, but also to give some insight into this – current team and and basically what's going on in the Big Ten. The first one is a former head coach at Ohio State that a lot of people remember, Urban Meyer. You remember him, don't you? I, I know him a little bit, yeah. You know, you got the Urban Meyer Pint House uh, every Thursday where, where, where you guys do that kickoff. Uh, the, uh, the the uh, what, what do you call the uh, show again? I forget the name of it. It's Weekend Kickoff, and it's brought to you by our friends at Bryant Heating and Cooling Systems. Uh, also, Byers Auto and Coors Light are generous – uh, uh, contributors to that program as well. It's been a great time, uh, and we would very much like to keep doing it for the rest of the season as long as the restaurants are open. Yeah, talk about a plug, but, uh, you know, I, I kind of uh, back way, back myself into that plug. I was going to call it the, the, the kickoff for the weekend, but hey, I'm, I was really damn close, you know. And uh, But, you know, Urban, as I, as, I, as I tell Urban later, you know, he's, he's now a rising uh, television star, so uh, it is what it is at this point. Uh, but he gives us a great look. Uh, just, you know, at, at Indiana, at the Indiana series, at what's going on, at, as he calls it, the team up north, what's going on in the Big Ten East and, and nationally. And then and then we segue uh, into a conversation with Matt Finkus, who was a defensive uh, lineman on that 96 Ohio State team, which clinched its first Rose Bowl trip since 1984 with a incredibly competitive uh, victory uh, at Indiana in 1996. Uh, basically the same week that Bill Mallory had been fired as the head coach over there. You know, sometimes these programs that are struggling to get to a 500 and beyond, they don't realize what they've got, you know, when uh, they have a couple of lean years after that. And uh, definitely Indiana made a huge mistake in getting rid of Bill Mallory. But uh, we'll, we'll talk about that and the Indiana, uh, the current Indiana team. And then we'll come back and we're going to chop it like we always do for a few minutes going into this Showdown week, man, the, uh, uh, the, the, the biggest game possibly of the regular season, this ridiculous regular season that Ohio State is having uh, on the Ohio State schedule until the uh, Big Ten championship game. But with no uh, further ado, let's get right to my uh, talk with Urban Meyer. Urban Meyer, uh, former head coach at Ohio State, uh, former elite head coach in college football, and now rising television star. Urban, thanks for joining the Tim May podcast again. Always good to see you, Tim. Absolutely, man. And, uh, you know, I wanted to have you on this week uh, uh, to, to kind of recount uh, an interesting moment in Ohio State football history before we go into some sort of the Big Ten scene, the national scene. You were on the Ohio State coaching staff in 1987. I don't know if you remember that or not, if you remember that far back. Sure. 31 to 10, Indiana and Ohio Stadium. Uh, Earl Bruce called it the darkest day in Ohio State football history. What did it feel like from your vantage point? Like the darkest day in Ohio State football history, it was – they had a really good team. Bill Mallory and the Thompson was a running back, I believe, right? Yeah. The, the big running back. And But the one thing about Indiana, I made the comment on, on Big Noon Kickoff, is the, my respect for Indiana, they have always had good players. Some programs have just had a hard time getting good players. Indiana never really has in my mind. They, they haven't had great years all the time because they lose games maybe, you know, the, like I remember – when Kevin Wilson there, I thought he always had good players. Yeah. 
those two good running backs, two NFL, one was a first round draft pick, one was a second round draft pick. And, but they would always find a way to lose at the end. Now they're finding a way to win. So much respect to Indiana. All, and really always have, whenever we got ready to play that team, that was never one of those ones you just kind of thought, you know, we have better players in this, so we should beat them. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I remember, you know, I was covering, started covering Ohio State in 84, and in 87, 88, Indiana, probably the greatest win in Bill Mallory's uh, uh, tenure there, that was 41 to 10 or 41 to 7 over in Indiana in Memorial Stadium. I remember writing for the paper the next day, the dispatch, that uh, a new day has dawned in the, in, the, in the Big Ten because Indiana had dominated Ohio State that day. Since that moment, of course, they've lost what? I uh, uh, can't remember the number. They 25 straight, I think, to Ohio State, or they haven't won in 25 straight games over the last 30-something years. But uh, uh, what is your sense about this team? This is a team like you just touched on. I was going to get to that. They, they would get to the brink the last several years but not be able to finish. They're finishing this year. Is that, is that what you see as much as anything else as a difference? I do. And, and I remember when Kevin Wilson hired Tom Allen. Tom Allen was a, a no-name. I never heard of him. And I remember yeah. they – because Indiana always was good on offense under Kevin Wilson. On defense, they would struggle. And they hired this guy named Tom Allen. I remember kind of researching him, and I had my, you know, graduate assistants or assistants kind of do, do like they would. It's just, tell me about this guy. Give me his background. What are we going to see? And he was from a small school, many, coached many years of small schools, and then South Florida. And But you felt instant energy on that defensive side of the ball. They were the best number one turnaround defense in America in 2016. Yeah. And then Kevin resigns when he had that, uh, uh, you know, that issues with the athletic director and all that stuff that went on. Yeah. And they promote Tom Allen. And once again, who's Tom Allen? But the one thing about Tom Allen and his respect amongst the other Big Ten coaches is real because he's nothing but energy. He's nothing but – and when he faces teams, that's exactly what you get. You remember we had a little bit of dogfight – no, a couple dogfights with him. But his first uh, – the, the game that J.K. Dobbins had a breakout game at, at, in Bloomington, they threw for almost 300 yards on us. And the great energy – yeah. And the one thing I'll say this, and I said this on Big Noon as well, but it's not about him. There's other coaches well documented. Whenever you turn it on, it's about them. Tom Allen's not that way. And that's why I've always had great respect that he puts his players first. Uh, they're a very good team. You know, I, I don't know if they can beat Ohio State, but anybody can beat anybody. But you look at offensive line to defensive line to secondary to obviously the quarterback and receivers, that's a good team. There's not one of those where you just say they're really bad in a certain area. Yeah. I was going to say what stands out to me is they look like a – for the first time in a long time, they look like a complete team if you follow my drift. You know, I'm not sure they're still there from a roster depth standpoint for an, like an Ohio State. I'm, I'm sure they're not, as a matter of fact. But, but when they put that team on the field, it looks like a Big Ten contender-type team. Do you agree with that? I do. It's a unique year. This is the, you know, as down as the Big Ten has been since I think when in 2012 when I first got there, I thought, yeah. you know, realistically, you know, I can say it now, but I thought the Big Ten was bad back in 2012. When I first got there, I had no idea because we weren't very good. You know, we went uh, 12 and 0, and we we had some really good players, but not the depth, not not what we have now. You know, yeah. not not even close. Not even that. The whole trajectory changed in the you know, the three recruiting classes right after 2012. But the Big Ten was not a good league. Uh, I thought it became very good when Penn State started getting Saquon Barkley and then the, the rivals started getting the, uh, Rashawn Gary and, and Peppers and some really good players, elite defenses. Wisconsin, to me, looks solid. Indiana looks solid. Ohio State looks great. Other than that, I don't know. You know, Northwestern, I think they're, you know, they're always going to punch you right in the face, but – it is not a good year for the Big Ten. Yeah, I'm going to get into a little bit of that in just a second with you. But I, would, I did want to ask you specifically about Indiana. I made this remark on several radio shows I've done and TV and stuff I've done since that Michigan game at Indiana. Uh, in my opinion, Indiana had, as a collection, the better skill players in that game. I don't know if you agree with me or not, but, uh, I, you know, uh, this is kind of like morphing over into the team up north, as you call it. Uh, in a discussion about them, but that's what stands out to me about Indiana. They've got guys that can beat you if you give them a shot, right? I mean, Fillior 
is a pretty interesting. Wap Fillior, what a name, you know. The Prefogel or whatever, you know, however you pronounce his name. I mean, they've got a quarterback who since the last possession of that Penn State game in regulation has been playing on a different level. Uh, Michael Penix Jr., uh, what's your take on just the threat they bring to Ohio Stadium on Saturday? A uh, legit threat. Uh, really the only threat other than Wisconsin looked really good to me. When oh, they, yeah. I, th- I think he's a good coach at Graham Mertz. If you remember, we recruited him. He yeah. flat made a decision to go to Wisconsin or keep his commitment to Wisconsin. Uh, but I walked away saying that's a special guy now. Really good high school program, good family, uh, an extremely accurate player, leader. But uh, Indiana, when they beat the Wolverines, it wasn't an upset. Indiana's a better football team than the Wolverines. Think about it. I mean, it, really not close. And that's, that's hard to imagine we're at that point in 2020 to say when you watch Indiana, <clears throat> anyone who knows football, you watch that game and say, well, that was, you know, what's, um, yeah, it's probably a three touchdown, two touchdown team that's better than the team that was wearing white that day, not even close. Yeah, I was going to say you could have flipped the uniforms and no one would have been surprised. That's the way it looked to me. Uh, let's get into it real quick. What, you know, you, you spoke quite eloquently on Saturday uh, on Big Noon Kickoff about, you know, as you as the old saying goes, raise the hood, see what's wrong, you know, fix what's wrong. You seem to have the parts, but the engine, the, the car, the engine is not running like it should. What do you see that's just glaring to you about Michigan right I'm, You call them the team up north. What about the team up north right now, Urban? I mean, what, what just jumps out at you most? It's almost like it's been a steady decline. You know, in that 2016, when we faced, you know, I had one guy on our staff, Tim Hinton was our team up north expert. And we worked on that team. They still do. It's every day. I'd yeah. walk down the hallway and I'd say, Tim, let's go watch an hour. If I had an hour somewhere, a half hour, I'd say, let's watch some of this videotape. And and actually, I was with my son-in-law the other day. Or I was talking to him. And I, I said, you guys remember the one time that I walked down the hallway? And we weren't playing great. But I looked at these two young coaches, and hit, hit Tim, and I said, tell me about the team up north. They said, Coach, this is the best defense we've ever seen. And that was, like I said, back in the Jabril Peppers, Rashawn Gary, that number 73, the inside player. Yeah. Uh, they had uh, Jordan Lewis and a great secondary. And I remember watching the videotape saying, my gosh, that is the best defense maybe I've gone against, I've, we've coached against. And now you watch him, and it's, there's been a steady decline. Uh, you know, I am about this. I don't blame players. And I get very upset because I think that's a, that's a cheap excuse, man. When you, when you sit there and say, well, all of a sudden they have bad players, you know, that it's still Ann Arbor. It's still, they still recruit top 10 classes, you know. So now what I would always challenge our coaches, and I said this on big new kickoff, if I, I was, would always warn a, st- a staff member when I would hire them, say, listen, the one thing we don't do here is we don't blame players. And we're 50-year-old people making a lot of money. If I hear some of our coaches blame a 17-year-old for not playing well, I'll warn you one time, and then the second time you got to grab your gym bag and move on because we just don't do that here. I don't want our players know we're doing it, and uh, we just that's we don't have excuses here. Maybe you're not coaching very well, but don't, uh, don't start blaming players. So you, I, I don't want to hear that Penn State or the Wolverines have bad players because that's not true. They're not playing very well, and they're maybe not developed. But don't, don't say they're bad players. i tell you what, though. Last three <clears throat> games, Michigan State, Indiana, and Wisconsin, they have been outplayed. I mean, it, I mean there's no other like, – like I tweeted late uh, Saturday night, you know, maybe the best way to sum up Michigan right now is they're one in three. You know, they're a legit one in three football team if you follow my drift, and that's, that's stunning to me. Uh, it, it is stunning to me, and, and it's not like you see the Calvary coming right now. No, exactly. Well, real quick, Big Ten East, it's upside down except for Ohio State. Everything under Ohio State has gone through a washing machine. <laughs> and, you know, you've got Indiana sitting there. You've got Maryland uh, 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 right on down the line all the way to winless Penn State. I've I've said, you know, the, the probably best thing about Michigan having its problems is is maybe taking some of the attention heat off Penn, the fact Penn State's 0-4. I mean, are you kidding me? But uh, what do you make of that, Urban? I mean, is it just a product of of this particular COVID-19 season? I mean, what would you 
how would you describe it to your grandkids when they get old enough to, when they ask you, Grandpa, what happened in 2020 to the Big Ten East? Well, they, if you remember just a quick recent history lesson on both uh, the Wolverines and Penn State, they had really good players that walk away from the program. Yeah. I mean, like, really good. You had Micah Parsons. You had Jordy Brown, who got hurt. No, Kane got hurt. So, you know, yeah. I think Penn State's a little bit different because when you take when, – when Nick Bosa left Ohio State, we weren't as good. And it was much, more, much beyond the – he's a great player. When you take a man's man, uh, just a beast leader – uh, your toughest guy, your best player in college football, et cetera. Now, I don't – Micah Parsons, I, I don't know. I recruited him, but I don't know you can put him in the same category as Nick Bosa because Nick Bosa, to me, to this day, he's a franchise player. Yeah. And it's not just because he can rush a quarterback. It's because he's got all the intangible values of a great leader, great player. And when he got hurt and couldn't come back, that, that took every bit of air out of our sails. We had to get that – remember, we lost to Purdue. I mean, yeah. we had to get that boat. Our, our defense really never played the same the rest of the year. And it's amazing the impact. That's why I'll say lift under the hood and find out don't, all of a sudden you don't have bad players at Ohio State. It's just we weren't playing well because we, we lost all momentum, all sense of confidence, and that's, a, that's what happens. And I think that's what happened at Penn State when Michael Parsons left and then other players started leaving. You know, all of a sudden, you know, players are smart and coaches are smart. When, when you lose a great, great player, and you know the guy behind him maybe he's not as great, you know, reality sets in, guys, everything we train for, you, we're probably not going to happen. And so you lose that stinger. Um, Ann Arbor had this same. Nico Collins left. Uh, I can't remember. There was another player or two that walked out on their teams. Yeah. And that's – I'll be honest with you, Tim, that, wor- that scares the heck out of me for the future of college football. You know, I – if you have a bad year, you don't feel like it, you have an open transfer policy now where people can leave. I mean, that yeah. – for the maybe the viewer, maybe the average fan or viewer is like, man, they lost a great player. If it's the right – if it's the man – if it's the alpha dog, you yeah. lose more than a great player. You lose the sense of who you are. I, I agree 100%. You know, I've always, uh, I've always uh, said that, you know, the, the steel curtain defense at, at – Pittsburgh back in the late 70s uh, was a great defense. They've had so many guys get into the Hall of Fame, but I thought Mean Joe Green was the guy that really made that defense what it was because when you can have a, a disruptor like he was up front, you know what I mean? It changes the whole dynamic of how you have to play against that defense. And I agree with you about Mike, Mika Parsons. You know, that was, a, that was a, basically the stick that stirred the drink for uh, Penn State defensively, and you lose that. It's you, it's hard to replace great players, as you as you talked about with Nick Bosa uh, back back when when he had to leave the game with that abdominal injury. But uh, I kind of felt that way when uh, when Braxton Miller went down in fourteen, yeah. and, and I almost I mean not almost you know how I am I'm a panic guy, and so when he went down, I remember calling Shelley that night from the hotel and said we are in major we have a major issue here. Braxton's out, and she's like, oh my gosh, and I said yeah, and it was. <clears throat> reality set in that who, who was going to be that person because Braxton up to that point was our entire entirety of offense yeah and then he left but you know I, I just remember the conversation was the solve the mystery year you know and how do you put your teammates ahead of self and if someone goes down someone's got to pick up the rifle and and others did obviously but you know that, I'm telling you every coach has that that built-in fear if you if your monster goes down you are in a tough season yeah, and but it, but it's so gratifying on the flip side to see a JT Barrett step up, and then to see a Cardale Jones, who really didn't seem to give a flip. You know, as you as you pointed out in a, a really nice soliloquy a few weeks ago, uh, step up and and become the guy, and then play to kind of the level that a lot of people thought he could have played at from the beginning if he had if he had given a flip. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it is amazing uh, on a roster like Ohio State can have sometimes that you do have a guy in waiting often who's just ready for that shot, right? Yeah, no, that's where you got to, you know, I don't want to be an arrogant person, but I think that's where culture is so important, you know, yeah. and that's where, you know, it, it, culture drives behavior when be in, 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 in adverse situations. One way, one of two ways. Now that's at places like Ohio State, Penn State, Ann Arbor, you know, Alabama, Clemson, there's no, there's no middle round, middle ground. That's why, 
You know, yeah. I start, you know, I start hearing people talk about the Wolverines and well, you know, they've only finished third in the division, you know, and, but they're doing a good job turning the program. And I'm thinking where, what has happened when you start talking like that? Yeah. Can you imagine a day when someone says, you know, it's okay. You know, Ohio State's tried really hard and they, they're finishing in the top two or three. They never won the division. And, and that's pretty good. Ohio State would burn down. Yeah. I mean, the, the community would – I can't even visualize what that would be like. Well, you remember when nine and three was not good enough, you know what I mean, with, with Earl. I mean, you know, they, you know, it's like that's the way it is. Some places it's like that. Some places it's not. I mean, moral victories, whatever. Tom Allen, what stands out about Tom Allen? Tom Allen is not into the moral victory thing. I mean, you could, he's gotten so close several times against the big dogs, you know. He hadn't beaten Ohio State. In 87, Indiana beat Ohio State and Michigan for the, for, in the same year for the only time in, in their program history. And uh, that's what the challenge is for Ohio State this week, uh, is to not let that happen, right? <laughs> I mean. That's right. That's a real challenge. You know, this will yeah. be, uh, you know, Ryan Day had a, you know, another bye week. And so yeah. how do you keep, you know, sharp, you know, I, I said this on Big Noon Kickoff that there's two, term, two words that I've used my entire career, and I know Ryan does as well, in a terms game ready. And your job as a head coach is to have that team, when the foot sinks into the ball on game time, that team's got to be game ready. At what cost? At all cost. And so, you know, I think they're going to be full pads today. And so, what I, you know, the good thing about places like Alabama and Ohio State, there's no shortage of great players to go against each other because people are going to get – Indiana's going to be a little bigger and a little faster and going to play harder than anyone. they Because realistically, you look at Ohio State, who they played so far, I think there's one win. Yeah. You know, yeah. they're not good teams they played. You yeah. know, they should be, but they're not. So yeah. what happens is and all of a sudden you're, in, you're out there in a game, uh, uh, Pete Werner, uh, Tuck Borland, and the guys you're tackling are a little better than the ones you've tackled the previous week. So that's why you have to do a little good on good on practice and try to, you know, that's how you get them game ready. Yeah. Hey, hey, real quick, uh, I just want to get to before, before I cut you off here. Uh, um, how do you think you would have handled – that as you look back on it now, we're deep into this. I was asking you back in June, how are you going to handle a COVID-19 season? Now I'm asking you now, how do you think you would have handled a situation where on Tuesday afternoon you're getting ready to play at Maryland and Wednesday before practice, uh, 30 minutes before practice starts, you find out you're not playing <laughs> that week. Um, how do you think you would have handled that? And like you're talking about getting game ready, Ryan Day's now, you know, immediately flipped the script. But to say that is easier than done. But how would you have handled it? And what what lessons have you learned from looking around the country about how coaches have sort of handled this situation? Well, the ability to adapt, and you know, you're, it's a trick question because you know me for 30 years, and I don't handle things well. I don't. <clears throat> I'm such a routine a believer in routine not just for the coach, because it's coach that's important, but for the players, it's so important. And, and I think Ryan has been masterful. You know, he's got a veteran offense team. You know, defense, we got a long way to go. But uh, this, this is the easiest schedule a house played in many, many years. He knows that. You know, you just got to get him to the dance, keep him healthy. This will be a tough one. But who, who are they going to play? You know, I think Wisconsin, like you said, and then when you get to the college football playoff, you don't have that big road game. You don't have, you know, Ohio State traditionally you've had that one or two or three games every year. Who is it this year? You know, it's, it's Indiana. So I think he's handled it well, and you have to adapt. You know, I think Ryan has a good way of keeping a smile on people's faces. Uh, but it, it's a challenge, and culture is so important in challenging times. And it's, it's no different, Tim, in the pandemic here, in corporate America, you're going to see certain companies you'll never hear from again. They're done. Yeah. You know, the restaurant business is one-third of restaurants are going to disappear. And you yeah. can't say because they serve bad food. It's because there's cultural people issues in that organization. One thing Ohio State has right now, I'm very proud to say this, arguably one of the best cultures it's ever had. Gene Smith will tell you that. Ryan will, you know, just we've, the last five, six years, the recruiting has been, we haven't missed. Yeah. You have really, really good people. Look at the academics. Look at just the behavior. Look at, they're good people. And that's a, uh, along with great players. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, what has stood out, and you and I had this conversation before, you haven't just recruited four- and five-star players. You've, you've recruited four- and five-star people, you know, and that's a big, 
That is such a Hard big difference. It's like you said, man, you know, you can get a cancer in a program in all kinds of ways, but a, an easy way to get a cancer in a program is to recruit one. And Ohio State has really not done that, you know. Uh, I mean, I can't name a guy that I wouldn't have on this roster, you know, and it's that's interesting to me. Yeah, and it's, you know, Mark Pantone is the best in the business, and I would sit and stare, and so would, um, Coach Day does the same thing now and just stare at your roster. And we always put the blue, red, gold. I'm not sure this would be a good story sometime. But blue, red, gold, everyone's labeled a blue or a red or a gold. Blue, obviously, is a really bad color. And if you're a blue uh, character person, a blue player, a blue, that's not good. Yeah. And you might be a great player that has some academic or character issues. When you're blue, I would stare at that board, and I'd, a lot of times I'd go move that magnet and say, we're not doing that. We don't need to do that here. And I've made some mistakes in the past in my career where I let maybe an assistant coach talk me into a blue and I'm not, you don't do that. You know, and yeah. Gene, Gene is so good about that. Cause I, I would have that. I would actually have Gene Smith come in and we'd sit and talk about roster management. And it wasn't about who can jump high or run fast. Cause there's plenty of people that do that. How do they fit in? Ohio state's a complex, complex place. It's a 30 average ACT place that has 55,000 students on his campus. And every time you sneeze, you're in the front page of the paper. And by the way, you have to win every game you play. It's very complex. And that's where you better take a red. And then when you start getting more golds, and golds obviously, red's a good color. Uh, gold is what you strive to be. That's the Harry Miller. That's the Von Bell, the Jeffrey Okuda, the Paris Camp. You know, those are those gold people. Jonathan Cooper. You know, those are those guys that just, they're a, uh, JT Barrett. You know, I, I guess I could list 50 guys right now. Yeah, I was going to say, you're going to run out of gold stars here in a second. But, but right. you get the blue, red, gold, and it's a color coding system we have throughout the whole facility in the weight room, indoor, you know, everywhere. And the one thing a player better not be is a blue. And if you're blue, I'll give you a, a couple months, but then you better move to red or, or we're going to fill your scholarship with someone else. I was going to say, you had to start ordering more of those uh, gold pens as the, as the thing went along. Hey, last thing, who, who is a surprise? Is any is Notre Dame a surprise being where it is at the moment? Is, is playing in the AC? I mean, is there a team that's really just caught your eye, like keep your eye on this team? Uh, and there are two that, by the way, I think when the college football playoff committee finally meets, they've got to at least consider for that number four spot. And just from effort and everything else, as you see, University of Cincinnati, where you have a vested interest. <laughs> and uh, – and uh, Brigham Young, the way Brigham Young is just playing and stuff. But, you know, just give me just your quick take on the national scene and who has surprised you. Well, let's real talk about the non-Power Five, and that's uh, Cincinnati and, and BYU. Uh, obviously, I've always been the fan of the underdog. And, yeah. you know, the UC can beat anybody anytime. Can they sustain an SEC schedule? I don't believe they can. Same with BYU. I've been there. They yeah. just don't have depth. But – they are really, really good. They deserve consideration. The two teams to me are Notre Dame and Florida. Florida is legit. You know, if they continue to get better on defense, that's a legit – first legitimate threat I've seen in a minute to Alabama. Like legit. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Really good. I, obviously, their coaches – I love their coach. He's a dear friend, and I love the Gators and the fact they're back to looking that way. Uh, and Notre Dame is legit as well. Notre Dame you – know, it was never more evident when they just put it to Boston College when everybody thought that was a trap game. Sign of yeah. a great football team. There's no trap game. You just keep playing. So those are the four teams right now that I just – Florida and Notre Dame look legit, legit. I think they're playoff teams. Uh, Cincinnati yeah. and BYU, you know, the, you know it's got a, the sun and moon and stars got to line up perfectly. Something's got to happen for them to sneak in. Well, I told, I told you that Utah team in 2004, that was the one – I mean – I think y'all could have lined up against anybody and, and, and had a legitimate shot at winning that year. But that's one of those once-in-a-lifetime kind of teams for Utah, at least it was back then, that I even purported back then in 04, you were, you were way out there, that y'all deserved a shot that year based on the way things had fallen. You know, that was a BCS era. It was one versus two, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, you, you, sometimes you got to look past the blue bloods a little bit, you know, to, to get a little more – a new blood into the mix. And that's what I was looking at at BYU and maybe UC. Hey, one quick thing I wanted to, and I'm out of here. Uh, how would you have handled 
three or four straight losses as a head coach because I don't think you ever, ever dealt with that. I'm sure you didn't. <laughs> How would you have handled not, that? Not good. Not, not, oh, you asked me this hard question. I think you know the answer before you ask them. But one reason why I'm an analyst and enjoy my life is the L word. You know, I just – that something's wrong with me. You know, I just – when we lose a game, it takes me three months to get over it. You know, I'm still – yeah. We're far removed from a couple of those L's. And, and uh, I don't know. I, I think as time moves, you kind of get away from it. But the worst thing is I've always never, you know me, that I would blame myself. You know, and I would say, what in the world? That's why I always talk about lifting the hood and don't blame players. And what could you have done better as a coach? Because coaches, you know, players are players and coaches are coaches. Players respond to co – good coaches get players to respond. Bad coaches don't. And so I just never – Every time you had a darn loss, it was like, what could I have done differently? And there's a couple in my pocket. I won't share with you because we don't want to time it all and discuss them. But I know I, I could have coached better and we would have won. Yeah. And then that, that is very hard. To, that is very, very if – you, if you blame players, you just kind of, I guess, water off a duck's back and you kind of move on. You know, we were never that way. It was always what could – and I would replay that game for months on end about how I screwed that thing up and we could have done better. Yeah, I just know that when you lose three or four in a row, like Ohio, like Michigan and wow. uh, Penn State have, you're talking about lifting the hood, you're broken down on the side of the road, you know. I mean, uh, there, it's tow truck time, you know, in, in, in a lot of respects. It's going to be interesting. Urban, thanks for joining the Tim May Podcast again, my man. I always love hanging with you, Tim. Absolutely. Keep up the good work, too, man. I, you know, you're, you're must listen to on Saturday mornings, that's for sure. Thanks, brother. You know, awesome. Uh, I don't know if a lot of people could have played for Urban Meyer, the more I think about it, because, or let me put it this way. I don't know if a lot of people could have boxed with Urban Meyer now to think about, because he pulls no punches. Uh, right. Agreed? Yeah. And I mean, that's, look, I've, I've been around enough players and so have you over the years that you have to have a very special mentality. Uh, you also have to have one to work with him, to be quite honest, whether that's uh, an assistant coach or just participating in, in throwing an event at his restaurant. I mean, his mentality <laughs> never changes. I, I, I'm serious. Like he, that competitive fire to him burns in a way that I've never encountered in any of anybody else. Um, yeah. And that was, you know, that was true before. Uh, you know, I had, had more time to get to know him in the retirement life. It's still there, but I can only imagine what it was like, you know, 2012 for that team and and the difference to go. Not that Jim Trestle wasn't competitive, and we've talked about this before. Jim Trussell, Ryan Day, they all are elite competitors, but it's just a different deal around him. He, Urban, you know, and he'll tell, he'll tell you like it is in any situation, he's still doing that. Yeah, and, uh, and what he's always striving for is excellence in whatever it is he's involved in and quality. And, uh, you know, those go hand in hand. And uh, even with y'all's show, you know, it's the same, it's the same idea. It's the way he is on that uh, – a uh, big noon kickoff show. I mean, he wants, he don't want a whole lot of like, you know, manby pamby going on. He wants to talk football. He wants to talk, you know, the serious nature of what's going on that, that day. And uh, it never changes, you know, and, and, and speaking of, uh, it's kind of a interesting segue because I've got a guy on coming on now, Matt Finkus. I know, you know, of Matt Finkus was a really great uh, defensive lineman back in the day in the mid nineties when he Mike Vrabel, and Luke Fickle, you know, were the were the three amigos before the three amigos came along in the wide receiver core last last previous three years with Ohio State. But my point was that was a team that uh, it was pretty much where the John Cooper era was was reaching its zenith, and they had never been to the Rose Bowl under John Cooper. They hadn't been to the Rose Bowl since 1984. They went into Indiana in tough circumstances for Indiana. They had just fired their head coach Bill Mallory. But he was getting to play out the season, you know. And uh, that was a game where Ohio State was able to clinch the first Rose Bowl berth, like I said, in uh, 12 years. And the interesting thing was how that game went down, but the parallel sort of that you're seeing right now in this Indiana team that doesn't give up shows no quarter to the big names. We're going to come back and talk about that a little bit after my interview with Matt Finkus. But, yeah, that was, you know, that was an interesting time in Ohio State history too, agreed? Yeah, without a doubt, it's uh, three three bad dudes. I don't know, amigos might be the right. I don't know if that's strong enough. They were obviously all friends and 
and dynamos. But man, that's um, just thinking back to the nasty attitudes. There you go. The three, those three hombres to deal with up front. I mean, that was, that's a special group. You can still see it littered all over the Ohio state record book now. Yeah. Well, tell you what, uh, let's, let's dive into my interview with Matt Finkus and we'll be back in a moment to chop it up with awesome Ward. And as promised, ladies and gentlemen, yet another guest on this special edition of the Tim May podcast. It's always special, uh, Matt Finkus, when Ohio State's playing Indiana, right? Oh, absolutely. And I'll tell you what, even more so this year, the uh, the Hoosiers have got a going over there in Bloomington this year. Dude, this, this is, I mean, you know, it, this is an interesting year in all kinds of ways, as you well know. Uh, you know, yeah. I had Urban Meyer on my podcast this week, too, and uh, I was talking about how the Big Ten East is upside down after you get away from the top. You know, Ohio State is still Ohio State, but the but it is flipped upside down. And here you're sitting here looking at Indiana, four and zero, and and looking like a world beater. As I as I you know was telling people on radio and TV a couple of weeks ago when they beat when they beat Michigan, uh, they looked like if they'd have flipped uh, uniforms, you would not have been surprised by the result. Uh, and in fact, yeah. Indiana, in my opinion, had the better skill athletes as a group on the field that day. How does that even happen? I mean, it's recruiting. I think that, that you know, they've done a good job of, um, you know, kind of stepping into the void that Ohio State has left a little bit. I mean, as, um, you know, Urban um, kind of transitioned from the Trestle style of recruiting and Ryan has followed up with that as well. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that leaves a lot of talent in the state. Uh, you know, they, they go national. Uh, you know, Luke has done a great job filling that void at Cincinnati. He's getting a ton of four-star guys down there. Um, you know, and I think Indiana stepped in where, you know, it, it, it's a different world, Tim. I mean, you know, you don't yeah. have to go to Michigan. You don't have to go to Penn State to be on TV every week. You don't have to go to those schools to, you know, to get into the NFL. I mean, the visibility has changed dynamically across the board. <clears throat> and I think they got some young blood in there in the coaching staff. And, you know, they, they've got guys that are that are passionate about what they do. A lot of them have MAC backgrounds as well. So they, they've got some of that recruiting uh, ability in the state of Ohio for those guys that are being kind of looked over by, uh, by, by the big schools. And, and, you know, I think that that's, that's where the big talent gap has really come. And I mean, I, and I don't know how much it's Indiana being good and they're good, but I mean, that Michigan game is Michigan's bad. That's maybe the worst Michigan secondary I've ever seen in my 45 years of, of, of watching football. Um, hmm. But, but take nothing away from, from the Hoosiers. I'll tell you what, Penix can throw the ball around great arm, good arm strength, accuracy, and when you got to, when you have a quarterback like that, receivers get better. You know, the receivers are, are, are better for him because, you know, they believe in him. They believe that he's going to get the ball where it needs to go, and they're going to go up and make catches. I was going to say they, they've made some ridiculous catches. You know, yeah. as I, I've been telling people from the last possession in regulation a, against Penn State in that opening ser- in that opening game when they pulled that great comeback and then won in overtime. Uh, yeah. Michael Penix Jr., Michael Penix Jr. especially, has been a different player. I mean, you can see the confidence rising in him almost from play to play, but series to series. And, and you know, when he made those great plays at the end of that game and then in overtime for them to, to beat Penn State, which is now 0-4, by the way. Talk about uh, yeah. a snowball Man. going downhill uh, rapidly. But uh, they, they've been a different team. And you, you, can, you can literally see it, right? Yeah, I mean, and and sometimes you go back to Minnesota last year. I mean, sometimes all it takes for those teams to to really kind of turn the corner is that confidence level. And then you get that win like you did against Penn State, and now you know you can beat the big dogs. And it's not just, oh, we hung in there tight against, you know, Michigan. And we were were right there against Penn State. Once you take that next step and you beat those teams, your confidence level goes up. And those players now say, you know what, we can win these games. It's, It's not good enough just to be in these games anymore. We can win these games. And I think, like I said, with Minnesota last year, you started to see that confidence build throughout the year when they started winning some of these big games. And I think the same thing is happening right now with Indiana they believe they can win any game that they play which probably wasn't the case I mean ever in the history of Indiana football but I think this team believes that they can win any game that they play because they play an aggressive style of defense they come after you with the blitz their offense can score on just about anybody I think in the country so they've got a shot in every single game and now they believe yeah I agree with you let's let's go back in the time machine you know I had Urban go back to 1987 when Indiana beat Ohio State for the first (laughs) time since I think Woody Hayes' first season at Ohio State. Uh, yeah. And then Indiana won two in a row 
you know, 87 and 88. And as I, as I wrote in the, the uh, Sunday dispatch the uh, next day after that 88 game, when Indiana dominated Ohio state, uh, were you celebrating I, 20 years of the dispatch at that time yeah. in 87? Okay. I think I was already 70 years old at that point. <laughs> yeah, uh, they, they, they gave you the good, the gold watch already for that one. Yeah, exactly. By the way, you're going to be 66 <laughs> one of these days. I want you to remember that because I used to make fun of old people myself back then. Uh, but I digress. Bottom line is I said, a new day is dawned in the big 10, you know, and then, yeah. you know, Bill Mallory had it going on. Interestingly, you guys go over there in 96 you win that game in 96 and you're going to the Rose Bowl. Bill Mallory, I think, has already been fired, but he's fil- finishing out the year. You he know, got fired that did, week. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't know what they had in Bill Mallory. You know, I mean, no. that's, that's what gets me about a lot of these programs. They get to a certain level and then they kind of get on, they kind of get that bandwagonitis. And why can't it be like that every year? You know what I mean? <laughs> like it is at yeah. Ohio State almost every year. But yeah, you, you got, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I mean, you know, my four years, we played Indiana, I think three of the four years, and they played us tough every single year. I think my sophomore year in 94, I mean, it was a nail biter game and and, and they came in and and that was the one thing that Bill Mallory did is, you know, he was an innovator. I mean, he came in and he found a way to to knock you off your game plan. You know, whatever you, I I remember in 94, we came in, we prepared, they were, they were throwing the ball around and, and all of a sudden, you know, they line up. They had two big fullbacks, and they just started pounding the ball eye formation right down our throats and you know, throwing to the fullback out of the backfield and all kinds of different stuff. And that's really what happened in 96 as well. You know, they had Chris Ditto, who was a, a, you know, one of the leading passers in the Big Ten, ran the spread offense for 10 games up to that yeah. point. Next thing you know, they come out double tights with a, with a true freshman quarterback and run speed option on both sides. And it's something that we had not ever seen before, would, didn't prepare for had to go back and really, you know, at halftime, um, you know, luckily we hung in there the first half, but, but we were on our heels for, you know, that, that entire game because we had not prepared for any of that. And that's what Bill Mallory did really well. I mean, he, he, he brought his team and was going to give you something that you hadn't prepared for and see how well you adjusted to it. Uh, you know, luckily for us, we were able to just, <laughs> just enough really to, uh, yeah. to get that, to get that win, you know, and uh, everyone always asked me, Andy, you know, made a great play on the scrambling quarterback and got the ball loose. And, you know, my fat butt had to had to chug down to the end zone with it. It took a while, but I eventually got there. But, you know, and that, that kind of broke it open for us a little bit. And I think we, we uh, were able to score another field goal. And then Damon Moore had an interception as well. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, that, that, that was the, the, you know, talking to players from that era and still friends with some of those guys from that Indiana team. Um, you know, Bill and Mallory, that, they, they played their heart out for that guy. And he was an innovator for that program. And I, and I think you saw what happened after he left. They went right back to the Indiana of old, of not even really being competitive anymore. And uh, then we're able to, you know, finally kind of get things in the ship righted again now. Yeah. No, you're exactly right. I think this is the – this is – this is the moment or this is the time. And Kevin Wilson kind of had it, uh, was was building some things over there until his unfortunate yeah. uh, uh, dismissal or demise. Um, but yeah. Tom Allen is definitely taking it up several notches. And I, I agree with you 100%. This is the most lethal uh, Indiana has been since the 80s and 90s under Bill Mallory. And even in that game going in in 96, you know, they had lost what I think they – I think they were winless in the Big Ten or they were pretty close. And, yeah. Uh, and and but you guys did you do you remember having a sense of y'all taking them for granted or do you like you talked about did y'all draw on ninety four and ninety five as like wait a minute you know these guys are going to come out throwing haymakers you know what do you remember what the sense was going into that game because I want you to kind of equate what yeah. Ohio State players might be feeling right now against an undefeated Indiana go ahead you know I think that there was, there was pressure because you know that game was to clinch the Rose Bowl. Uh, you know, something that we hadn't hadn't done in my four years there. We'd come close, um, <coughs> excuse me, close in 93, you know, close yeah. again in 95. And then this, this was it. I and mean, we had the chance to clinch it before we even played the team up north. So, you know, there, there was, you know, I think guys were tense and, and they were tight with, with that knowledge coming in. Um, and then, you know, I, I don't think it was taking them for granted, but I really do. I mean, I give a ton of credit to Pug, you know, he made the in-game adjustments and halftime adjustments defensively that allowed us to, to really, you know, be able to, to stay in that game and eventually win that football game. Because again, like I said, they, they came out with something that we had never seen, hadn't seen the speed option since week one against rice. 
So yeah. we hadn't practiced. I mean, I mean, and you know, no one runs that. I mean, if, if a team is, is an option team and they come out and run spread, well, yeah, you play seven teams that run spread. You can adjust to that. You come out and you haven't seen any option or you haven't practiced against a speed option for 11 weeks and all of a sudden you've got to play against that live action in the game. You know, that, that's a whole different animal, a whole different ball game, schematically, fronts, coverages, all those different things need to change and things you probably haven't practiced in a couple of weeks or maybe you practice a couple of times here or there. But, you know, I think it was it, it was a lot of the pressure of being able to clinch that Rose Bowl. And, and then again, you know, what Bill Mallory and that Indiana team did to throw us off kilter. And then defensively, they did a great job, too. You know, they had some, some yeah. good players, um, especially on the defensive line, I remember. They were just causing havoc. I mean, and they just – they sold out to stop the run. They dared us to pass. They, they loaded the box. I think Pepe Pearson had like 40 or 50 yards uh, yeah. going into the fourth quarter. I mean, you know, so, so they just – they, they put all their eggs in that basket that they were going to do everything they can to beat us that game. And, and luckily we were able to come out on top of that. Now I think this, this team is a little bit different when you talk about Ohio state now uh, versus then, uh, you know, I don't think Indiana is going to sneak up on the Buckeyes this weekend. <laughs> I think that everyone knows if you've watched them at all, you know how good they are and you know that what that offense can do, you know, how aggressive that defense is. So I think that, that, uh, you know, Ryan day is over there preparing this football team. Like this is a top 10 matchup, but don't, doesn't matter what name's on the jersey. This is the number nine team in the country coming in undefeated, you know, scoring 40 points a game. We got to be on our A game here. It doesn't matter, like I said, what the name is on the jersey. This is a really good football team. So, uh, yeah. you know, I think it's going to be just as much pressure as, as they normally face. But, you know, I think that's one of the great things that Urban has done and then passed down to Ryan Day. You know, they thrive on these situations. They relish these situations of, of really being able to, to, to be in these spotlight moments and perform. Yeah, flex their muscles, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. What a, got to this year because you don't know how many games you're going to get. So I mean, a yeah. matchup like this, this might be the only top ten you know game that they've got until possibly the Big Ten championship game, and you know maybe you catch an undefeated Wisconsin team in there or something like that. But this might be one of your only chances because as we saw last week with Maryland, you know you you don't know what's happening next week. You know <laughs> you don't know if the other team is going to be able to be there next week. So you got to take care take care of business and show every, show what you can do every week. I was going to say at two at two twenty nine, I think on last uh, Wednesday, uh, Ryan Day and his staff were getting ready for Maryland. At two thirty, they weren't. You know. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. That's that's how quickly it can change. Hey. Yeah. You know, I mean, and, and you got to be got to be able to prepare and adjust to that, and I think that's what they've been able to do really well. Yeah. And speaking of a crazy year, just think about, but think about it from Indiana's point of view, and I know that's what you're doing too. They beat Penn State in the opener. They beat Michigan. Like I said, they could have flipped uniforms in that game. Yeah. And if it had been the team in the white winning, you wouldn't have been surprised. Agreed? Yeah. No, I mean, I think okay. that they really dominated that football game. Oh, yeah. Um, I, you know, that's one thing. If you watch that uh, Michigan games earlier on, uh, obviously the secondary is their big issue right now. And, and, and you know, that, that was just strength versus weakness. And, and it, I, I didn't really think that that was going to be much of a challenge game for Indiana when you watch – how Michigan DBs had performed up to that point and how well Indiana's uh, offense and running game had performed up to that point. You know, I, I think that, that if people who watch football a lot weren't shocked at that result. Uh, now, no. we, obviously, you throw the names into that, and, yeah, it's a, it's a shocking result. But, uh, but yeah, I think, that, you know, you look at Indiana, they're a team that, that, uh, that like I said before, you know, now they believe. They, they believe they can win these games. They believe they can, can win against anybody. Um, and, and, you know, they're going to come in and play like that. <coughs> Yeah, I, I tweeted during the middle or late in that game against Michigan that if Ohio State doesn't throw the ball at least 45 times against Michigan, there ought to be an inquest, you know, because, oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah. They don't I mean, much, I, I, Justin, they Justin have no Fields pass rush and they can't cover. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry, yeah. But. yeah. No, Justin Fields should throw for 1,000 yards if they leave him in the game long enough. I mean, it's going to be a, a, a real issue. And I, I think I sent something out, you know, Don Brown's coaching those defensive backs like the rules are like from 1995 or 96. I mean, yeah. I've never seen so much grabbing and holding and, uh, it, I mean, just pa blatant pass interference. I mean, you can't do that these days. You just can't. Um, you, and, and so you all, it's, minute, it's a coaching you issue. You almost could call pass interference on them on every play. If you if you really watch video, I'll, I'll go back and watch video and slow. And it's just – it's crazy how – the word I'm using is scrambling. They're doing, you know what I mean? The scrambling yeah. they're doing to to try to to try to be competitive. It's crazy. I want to ask you this though. I mean, think about this. This is a feather in the in the cap moment for Indiana because it beat Penn State in the opener. 
It beat Michigan like a drum, and it could add, for the first time since 1987, it could add a season where it has beaten Michigan and Ohio State in the same season. I mean, they are this is definitely a red letter game for the Hoosiers. And, you know, it, do you ever remember when you were playing, did you sense when a team was really, and that was almost every weekend for you guys, I know, just like it is now, but when a team was really gunning for you? Yeah. I mean, I think when you play at Ohio state, you, you, you feel that every week. I mean, you're going to get everyone's best shot as you saw with Greg Schiano and Rutgers, you know, teams are going to pull trick plays out of the book and, and throw everything that they can at you because that's their Super Bowl. Um, yeah. you know, especially those mid tier, uh, big 10 teams and, you know, Indiana right now is looking at this and, and that, I think that's going to be the challenge for them. I mean, the, the challenge for them is going to be, okay, we've beaten, you know, Penn state, we've beaten Michigan you know, everyone knows that that Ohio State's on a different level than those teams. I mean, even at, even when they're good, Ohio State is still a, a, a little bit above them. Yeah. But the question for Indiana now and their players is, do they really believe that they can compete at this elite level that Ohio State's at? Or are they just trying to kind of fool themselves and say, you know, well, we beat Penn State, we beat Michigan. They've got to be convinced in, in, you know, in their hearts and minds that their play is good enough to be able to to win this football game. Because, you know, you look at where Michigan's at now, you look at where Penn State's at now, those wins, while the name's great, uh, you know, in the, in the grand scheme of things, those, those wins don't have the luster they did at the time that they happened. Um, yeah. so, so I think that the challenge for Indiana is going to be, you know, blocking all that stuff out, blocking out, you know, the, the, you know you're, you're the media darling right now. You're the Cinderella story of, of college football. How can you block that out and prepare and, and you know, really scheme – to try to beat a, an elite team in, in Ohio State because it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, no one's no one's going to pat you on the back when you run out of the horseshoe and say, "Well, you beat Penn State and Michigan. You guys did a great job." Like that doesn't matter anymore. So, can they put all that stuff behind them? And do they believe that they can really compete at that elite at elite level? You know, they did when they. You know, they believe that when they played Penn State at the beginning of the year when they played Michigan. But now, do they still believe that? Seeing what Penn State and Michigan is now, that's going to be the challenge for that football team. Yeah. Hey, last thing, man. You, you know, you've been around. You've been on my podcast before. You've been around. By the way, how's business? Doing good, man. We're we're, we're plugging away, <laughs> just like everybody well, else here, man. Give, give, give yourself give yourself a little bit of plug for your business. Give us your name, uh, location, et cetera, so people can uh, can still take take part, even if minor shutdowns come down come down <laughs> again. Well, we've been open pretty much all through the shutdowns. We actually closed down uh, the Grandview location for uh, and, and it's Winans. Uh, it's a franchise from my hometown. We do uh, coffee, chocolate, and uh, we do wine at the uh, Grandview location. But we have the location at Grandview Yard at 1125 Yard Street. We've got the location in Old Dublin at 52 South High Street there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I feel pretty confident yeah. that we'll, we'll still be up and running no matter what uh, the governor tries to throw down the pike. Uh, you know, I don't know what indoor dining is going to look like and all that stuff. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, stop in, get yourself a coffee. We've got some of the best Buckeyes you can, can have. We'll still be kicking. Yeah, that's, yeah I, I like that one up in Dublin, too. It's like a great location, but, but I digress. <laughs> uh, <laughs> last thing I want to ask you uh, is – what, what do you make what do you make of Michigan right now though what is is this a moment I mean it, it, you know um, like urban and I were talking about you know wow uh, even under rich rod um, yeah. you, you have to, you know it were they that bad I mean and it yeah it, how close does it look like that he's lost his team I mean you know you know what I'm talking about I mean oh, uh, his team's gone yeah I mean, uh, his team is gone what's I think. your take I mean, on that from watching I think this is a tipping point for Michigan. I think that this is a real test for their AD. Now, contractually, are they going to fire Harbaugh during the season? Um, you know, they can save ten. Was it five million? I think by by waiting until the end of the season. But I mean, I think you got to announce that that you're going right. to terminate his contract at the end of the season and start building momentum and start trying to find a coach. And I don't think you need a name. I don't think you need a big name. I don't think you need to make a splash. You need someone who's going to believe. And, 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 and I don't even know if you need a Michigan man. You just need a coach who's going to come in there and get these kids excited and who's going to develop players. Because I think that's the thing that we've um, really – they've struggled with. Um, you know, Harbaugh's had top five recruiting classes. He's had those players yeah. come in. They're not, they're not developing. They're not becoming better. Uh, you know, especially offensive line, um, you know, 
defensive backfield. They're just, they're not developing. So I don't know if Jim can get away with, you know, cleaning house on, on some of the position coaches and, and retaining the job because I think I, I think he, he's lost it. I think he's lost the, the locker room. He's lost the confidence. Um, I, I don't see them being able to make a turn with him at the helm. I, I think that they're going to have to go in a different direction. They're going to have to pony up the money to, to get him out of there. And you got to find someone who's going to inspire that, that, that program to be better um, because he just, he's not doing it right now. I mean, he's, you know, the, the press conference is the same old coach speak of we've all got to be better. We've all got to do better. I mean, at this point, I mean, you're just, you're getting abused by bad teams. I mean, there's got to be a come to Jesus. And, and it's just, you know, I know the AD up there is, is a big fan of him, and that's why he's been um, able to kind of have this free reign. I know I talked to a lot of the uh, football alumni there and, and they are displeased. I mean, they, they've been displeased for, a good two, three years now. Um, so he, there's got to be starting to get some pressure on him, um, you know, from the donor base as well. Uh, I think this is going to be the end of the road for him, and, and hopefully they can find someone that gets them back to, to some level of prominence and can inspire some better play. Yeah, you know, you brought up something real quick. I mean, Bo, uh, Bo Schimbeckler was a guy that I think coined the phrase Michigan man, and Bo Schimbeckler yeah. coached with Woody Hayes. Bo Schimbeckler, I think, first time he was ever – anything to do with Michigan's when he became the head coach up there. He was from Ohio, uh, Barberton. Yeah. I think. Miami university. Um, I may yep. have the, I may have the wrong. Yeah. I may have the wrong, uh, hometown, but I have the right home, uh, state. My, my $64,000 question, you know, Gary Moeller was a hell of a coach up there until he had a little bit of trouble off the field. He was an Ohio state <laughs> captain. Uh, yeah. Is your friend really good friend, Luke fickle. <laughs> could you see him entertaining an offer? from the University of Michigan, if it comes down to that? I don't think so. Um, I could be wrong, but I, but I don't see that. Um, I mean, there's some lines you, you just uh, you just don't step across. Maybe. <laughs> and if then, you can hear me, and, stop and, talking for a second, because we've kind of lost your reception at the most critical – wait a minute. Stop talking for a second, because we lost your reception at the most critical moment of that question. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, Let's start. Let's start that question over with again. Uh, well, tell you what, just pick up from what I, what I asked you. If you can still okay. hear me, can you hear yeah, me? I still got you. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, just just give me. Okay. Yeah, start your answer yeah. again, and they can they can cut out all this other riffraff in here. Gotcha. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't see that happening. Um, I could be wrong again, but but I really don't. I think that Luke's in a great situation there. Uh, you see. Uh, you know, I mean, he's going to probably be brought up for, for a lot of jobs that, you know, it, just, I mean, the, the situation is what it is, but, but again, I think that there's yeah. just some lines that you don't cross. Um, and, and, and that might be one of them for him. Um, you know, I, I think that again, it, it's going to take him a lot to get out of Cincinnati. Uh, I don't think that it's just going to be, um, you know, anything that it, just any job, you know, it's going to have to be a really good job that gets Luke out of Cincinnati. And, and I don't know if that's a good job right now. Uh, I mean, as, as crazy as that is to say, I don't know if Michigan is a top tier job right now. I mean, that's a rebuild. I mean, you're, you're in total rebuild mode uh, there. And, and, you know, I mean, there's the rivalry too. You know, the, I don't know that, that that's a position that he's willing to, uh, to, to, to go take a leap on. So um, I don't yeah. see that happening. Um, you know, I thought Michigan State would have been a good fit for him. Uh, you know, I mean, Notre Dame, like, the, you know, I mean, I, those schools, I think that, or could be on the radar eventually if those positions ever come open. Um, but, but yeah, I think that might just be a bridge too far. Yeah. I was going to say, you said there's the line you don't cross. It's the state line. <laughs> I think is what you're trying to say. Yeah. Exactly. Just north of Toledo. <laughs> exactly. Just north of Toledo Matt a little Fink, bit. You don't cross that one. Yeah. Matt Fink, it's always a pleasure having you on the Tim May podcast, my man. I appreciate it. Always buddy. Yep. Thanks for having me. Man, as always, I appreciate Matt Fink is coming on with me, man. He tells it like it is, just like Urban Meyer does. And, you know, the interesting part about all that, when you glean it, awesome, is that uh, Indiana is coming in with a lot of things going for it, including that belief factor. And that's that's what Ohio State has got to deal with as much as anything else on Saturday at high noon in Ohio Stadium. Yeah, it's, you know, it's much easier for um, us on the outside to look at what Indiana has done and put it in the context of, okay, Michigan is uh, historically awful by their program standards. Penn State, you know, they did dominate that game, but they lost, and now they're 0-4. Um, you know, Rutgers 
wasn't didn't light the world on fire in that win. And then, um, you know, Michigan State, it, it, that was sort of a strange game where maybe Indiana is good enough where they can just coast through a second half and do absolutely nothing. Um, but the other, the flip side, of course, like we can do the same thing that Ohio State Rutgers with that game, however you want to view it. You can say 24 yeah. to nothing over Michigan State is not that impressive considering how terrible that is. But all of that doesn't matter to Indiana. They beat Michigan. They beat Penn State. They're 4-0. and They're in first place in the Big Ten East uh, based on games played. That'll be all that they're worried about. They know that they had to prepare for good teams uh, and that they beat teams in the Big Ten that it's never easy to do it no matter where you play or when you do it. So um, in within their locker room in Bloomington, when they hit the road on Friday, they're going to be very confident. That can be uh, a very dangerous thing. We've also seen this with other teams, though, that uh, felt like they were ready to take a good shot at Ohio State uh, and then realize that there's a difference uh, in, in competition when you step up to, to face the you know, three-time defending champs. And I was not surprised at all to see that this was still a 21-point spread because that's still the talent differential, at least, I think, between these programs right now, at least on paper. Yeah, you know, and the, <clears throat> the interesting thing is, you know, as much as that uh, cancellation of last week's game at Maryland as much as that was a lightning bolt to Ohio State and to uh, to Ryan Day, like I said, at, I think 229 on Wednesday, they were still getting ready for, for Maryland. At 230, they weren't. You know, I mean, that's how quickly in this COVID-19 era things can change for your team. But I, I, I get the sense just from, you know, just being around, et cetera, listening to people, et cetera, I think this may enhance Ohio State's uh, hunger for this game coming up in Ohio Stadium, the new the new challenger on the block wanting to come in and throw uppercuts and maybe knock Ohio State off the pedestal, you know, trying for the first time in 1987 to beat both Michigan and Ohio State in the same year. I'm talking about Indiana. Uh, also, just think about the pelts that this Indiana team already has on its belt, Penn State and Michigan. If they had a third belt, Ohio State, no matter what's going on with those teams, those are those are basically blue bloods, traditional blue bloods of major college football. And they, they literally are going for a third pelt. That, that would be unprecedented yeah. uh, as far as the Indiana football program is concerned. Flip side of that is Ohio State knows that. Uh, Ohio State understands the challenge. Uh, and now they didn't have this distraction, which would have been a game at Maryland, which we had really no clue how that Maryland game was really going to go. We had an idea. But, you know, until you play the games, I mean, Penn State had an idea of how its Maryland game was going to go until it refused to tackle in the first half, you know, and then weird things happen. But I think Ohio State's had a chance to basically get a little more well agreed and recharge its batteries because uh, they've been going at it pretty hard now for like really five or six straight weeks when you really get right down to from a practice standpoint and then playing standpoint and they really focus on this surprise challenger that's coming out of the weeds. Yeah, it's all of that is is really interesting because Ohio State is angry that it didn't get to play. You know, it, yeah. you know, all the conversation that we had, you know, you and I last week on the show or any other, you know, anywhere else in the media really just talking about, well, where can Ohio State get better? What happened in that second half against Rutgers? Uh, you know, is the secondary ready for, uh, you know, Tagovailoa and Jarrett and, and Maryland? I mean, I, they, they hear that, especially probably more than ever with, you know, being in lockdown and, and the only people that you can only outside connection you have for them is, is going to be through social media. Of course, they're going to see that. And I think not just that part that they wanted to prove, you know, that they're better than that, that they could play a four quarter game. They just want to play football. They fought so hard to play and to have that snatched away on Wednesday in the middle of game preparation really, uh, really made them angry. There's no other way to say it. Ryan Day, uh, you know, I think He's always done a great job of, of hiding how he's really feeling inside, but you could see that bubbling up for him on Thursday, uh, yeah. how frustrating it was for them because they just want to play. They weren't, this isn't a program that wants to skate by and take a, a free cancellation and, and hope that the win loss record looks a little better at the end of the year. They have no interest in that. They want to play every single week. They yeah. know that they're good. They want challengers to step up. And that's why this week, especially like, They'll, they'll embrace that opportunity that Indiana thinks that this is, you know, or, or it is a, a huge opportunity for them. Um, they will be exci more excited by that than anything else, but they also just want 
uh, to simply play. And I think that's why you'll see Ohio State at its best. Now, there's also this element that I think is interesting, Tim, where you talked about the stretch of long practice and they play three weeks. They weren't perfect games, but then you, you know, they weren't expecting the off date. They practice on Saturday. They're out of a routine. Like they, they haven't really had a chance yet to, you know, play their best game. And then suddenly they were stopped when they were, you know, looking to prove something in the secondary against Maryland or whatever. Like that's an interesting dynamic here is that Indiana that you talked about their momentum and their confidence. Ohio state has, has the confidence, but maybe not the momentum part because they just had to hit, hit pause through no fault of their own. Um, you know, I, I, want, I don't know. I don't think that's going to s- slow down Ohio State, but it's certainly one thing that's in my mind as I'm trying to think of what the score might be because I've not been very good at it so far this year. Yeah, I mean, the score thing is what it is. I think, you know, I still feel pretty confident about picking Ohio State to score at least into the 40s even this coming weekend. You know, the question is whether they can keep uh, keep it from becoming a punch, counterpunch kind of game with Indiana, which under under with Michael Penix Jr. running the show at quarterback, like I keep telling everybody from that last possession of regulation against Penn State on, he's been a different player. He's been on a different level. He's gotten better from week to week, almost play to play. And uh, with Ohio State, you know, they kind of they kind of scratch where Ohio State itches on defense because Ohio State, you know, has shown some vulnerability to the pass uh, and and uh, whether or not whether uh, Indiana can protect and give uh, Michael Penix Jr. time to throw the ball on Saturday in a, in a reasonable way, I mean, I think it could go a long way in that. But, I mean, you know, Watt Fillior and that Prifogel kid have become household names, at least in Indiana. <laughs> Those are interesting household names, but you know where I'm going. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, now this, is, this, is, this really is a showdown. I mean, it has showdown all over. That doesn't mean the game's going to be close. Uh, but I think the game could be close. But, but you're right. I mean, now Indiana's dealing with an Ohio State team, which is angry, didn't get to play, wants to prove itself, has a quarterback who's in the Heisman Trophy race, without a doubt, who didn't get a chance to chalk up big numbers last week when the big numbers were there to be had yeah. against Maryland. I think you agree with me on that. And uh, uh, it's, you know, just just the, the uh, vim and vigor that you think Ohio State's going to bring to this high noon kickoff uh, in Ohio Stadium is going to be interesting. It's a nationally televised game by Fox, and uh, you know it's a chance for Ohio State to put its best foot forward. But I was thinking about this. You know, we're talking about this. We're recording this on a on Monday. You know, we were pretty fired up about what we were going to see on Saturday this time a, a week ago at Maryland, and then suddenly Wednesday everything changed. Think yeah. about this: if this game suddenly had to get canceled, you would you would then face the possibility of an Ohio State and an Indiana both being undefeated through the regular season. And uh, uh, that would be an interesting take uh, going into the, quote, Big Ten championship game of who really got to go there, right? Well, I I mean, if Indiana could run the table after that, that would certainly – They'd have more games, right. Add an interesting dynamic, but they would have to also beat Wisconsin to uh, make that happen. I consider myself very skeptical of Indiana's chances of beating both – well of getting a cancellation to stay undefeated through this week and then beating Wisconsin in a couple of weeks. But the other, the other part to that, Tim, that now, which makes it so hard to talk about December 19th is if there are two cancel, two teams that have to cancel, you know, suddenly Ohio state now has an option to play one of those big 10 teams and change the schedule. Even if it's a rematch, I don't know why the league, apparently it's because ESPN's Heather Dennett reported this over the weekend. Apparently that decision had been made 11 days ago. And they never told anybody about it. Never, I never saw a media release. I never saw them acknowledge. Now, again, you know, there hadn't been an opportunity. There was only one game cancellation every week. That situation hadn't popped up yet. But if, if Ohio State has another game cancellation and somebody else does, then we might not even, might even play Indiana this week. They might play somebody, you know, might play Purdue. I don't know. It could be anybody. Yeah. Um, but that's a, such a – to me, what blew my mind over the weekend when that came out was like, well, that seems obvious. Why wouldn't you have done that? Like, it's such a common sense move, uh, and they're making this up as they go. Like, I'm, I am impressed that they got this one right. Like, it would have been cool if you could schedule anybody, as Nebraska can attest from a couple of weeks ago, and, and everybody was throwing around the fairy tale of Ohio State-Alabama on Saturday. You know, yeah. Nick Saban was uh, never, ever going to agree to play uh, Ohio State on two days' notice to game plan. Um, 
I don't, and in my heart of hearts, I don't believe that Ryan Day would have either, but uh, either. that's, I think that's what makes all this stuff about tiebreakers and, you know, cancellations. Like it's impossible to know what's going to happen from week to week. You know, as you said, that was Tuesday's podcast. And the very next day we had actually just recorded a practice report uh, five minutes before it was posting to YouTube five minutes before that game was canceled uh, yep. with Maryland last week. Like this thing can all change in the drop of a hat, but I don't know that. I don't want to go too far down that road of undefeated Indiana, undefeated Ohio state. I think the odds of that exact scenario playing out are, are quite small, but that's also, I mean, who knows 2020, any scenario can play Dude, out. 2020, 2020. There is, you know, I, I, like I was on wall to wall sports on Sunday night, you know, and I'm on all these radio shows during the week, building up the games and stuff. And people keep asking me, you know, hypotheticals. I go, you can't, you can't do hypotheticals right now. There is no given. There's no given. I keep repeating. There's no given that SEC teams are going to play 10 games, even though some have been postponed to, to a later weekend. There's no given that all of this is going to happen, that you're going to have uh, a 6-0 and or 7-0 and Ohio State being compared to a 10-0 and Alabama or whatever. You know, there's no given that any of that's going to happen from a number standpoint. All you can do, as Ryan Day is pointing out, you know, you roll with the punch, man. You roll with the punch, and then you get ready for that next game. And uh, that's where Ohio State. I know he's got this team. Uh, you just got. He's got to feel he's got this team pointed in the right direction from a standpoint of motivation. And uh, you know, and it may all come to fruition on Saturday against Indiana. I've, I've I've got a sense. Just right now, I've got a sense Ohio State maybe might might play its best game of the year so far. What's your take on that? Yeah, I think that that's. That's coming for Ohio State, and and we can all see, you know, the upside when you're talking about comparing them to Alabama or Notre Dame, um, Clemson. You know, that's it's obvious who the best teams in the country are, whether they're playing six games or ten. Yeah, uh, and that's true even if even if within Columbus, when we're talking about Ohio State, you know, and being fairly critical of some of the things that have happened in the second half against Penn State or the second half against Rutgers, that's all because we recognize the fact that the only measuring stick for this team is Alabama, Clemson, Notre Dame, the, the truly elite, the college football playoff teams. Um, so that's why I think after we see Ohio State at its best on Saturday against Indiana, that the Big Ten should just quarantine Wisconsin and Ohio State for two weeks, let them play the Big Ten championship game safely, maybe just send them to Indianapolis for two weeks. I don't know. Just get them there ready for that game. They're the two best teams in the Big Ten. Let's get ready for that title game. Just acknowledge that the rest is a risk that you can't take. Let them settle it on the on the field. Uh, I mean, we'll, we'll see. If North, Northwestern Wisconsin is coming up, that'll be interesting too. But I think it's clear who the two best teams are. And then let's build a bubble in Glendale or Dallas or wherever and send Clemson, Alabama, Notre Dame, and Ohio State there uh, and get ready for a national championship. Because the rest of this, like, there's nothing else to be proved for Ohio State against Illinois or Michigan State. I know that this sounds sacrilegious to say, you know, skip the game, but I mean, other than truly embarrassing your rival, which I think there's value for that for uh, Ohio State fans, like that game is going to be a, an absolute massacre. And there's, so there's nothing else for Ohio State to prove. They beat Indiana, beat Wisconsin. That should be all that matters for them. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's awesome word. I'm not sure I totally agree with everything he just said, but he has the right <laughs> to say it because this is the United States of America. Land of Where am I wrong? Of, Where am I wrong? Land, land of the free, home of the brave, and uh, sanctuary for the glib. But, uh, no, I, I, I can I can see all kinds of merit in what you're saying. But uh, it's like I just keep saying, you have no idea what's coming next, you know, with this thing uh, and how things are going to react. It's just – I don't like living in the past for all kinds of reasons. <clears throat> but the only thing I will redress from the past is it's too bad the Big Ten had it figured out back in August as far as the scheduling was concerned and, uh, you know what I mean, the buffers, the four- and five-week buffers yeah. put into the schedule where you could still replay games, et cetera. And just on, just on a knee-jerk reaction, they totally backed away from that and backed themselves into this corner to where now the, the rules are going could be changing from week to week about how they're going to conduct business, you know. And, yeah. of course, always always leave it to the uh, national media getting the, getting the inside word before uh, 
all of us slobs who actually cover the Big Ten from uh, day to day get it right, uh, awesome? No comment. Yeah, exactly. That really, you talk about losing friends, man, or making enemies. That that really just sticks in your craw. But anyway, past that, awesome work. Thanks for joining the Tim A podcast again, my man. Did you like that? That was the shortest answer I've ever given on this podcast. Yeah, I did like that. But you know what? Uh, we'll see if you can keep that up next week uh, when we <laughs> return with yet another version of the Tim May podcast in this COVID-19 era. Everything, you just got to keep your hands up and keep swinging, man. That's the way I look at it. But until then, for Awesome Ward, this is Tim May. We'll see you then. <laughs>